All right. So real quickly, before we get started, um, I would like to thank everybody for coming. My name is Gabe Turan from Interneighborhood Council Organization. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and go ahead and turn it over to Jack Via, our INCO chair. Okay, good evening, everyone. It's Thursday, June 11th, a uh, little after seven o'clock, and I wanna thank everyone for joining us. Uh, uh, my name is Jack Via, I'm the chair of the INCO, and with us is uh, also Gabe Turan, the first vice chair, uh, and second vice chair, Dan Ryberg, and third vice chair Michael Gleason, and also fourth vice chair Diana Velzi. From the city, we'll have uh, during for our presentation uh, the city manager uh, Alex Nguyen. We lost your video, Jack. Your audio. In coordination with the INCO. And oh. so, did everybody get that? We got you back, Jack. We had lost your audio for a second. Oh, okay. Where did you? We, we heard you uh, introduce uh, Alex, the city manager, Mr. Nguyen. Okay. Uh, with us is uh, the city manager, Alex Nguyen and Chief Financial Officer Kevin Riper, Police Chief Scott Whitney, and Police uh, Chief Darwin Base. Uh, and uh, I wanna thank everyone for participating. Um, Gabe, do you wanna? Sure, thank you very much, Jack. So again, my name is Gabe Turan, uh, first vice chair for the INCO and Fremont South Neighborhood Council chair. And again, thank you all for coming out. And I just have some really quick uh, instructions for all of you for Zoom if you haven't used it before. As I had mentioned, there's an interpretation function for those who wish to use it. Uh, you can see here that uh, these are the functions that we'll look at using for this evening. At the bottom of your screen, you should see these three functions, chat, raise hand, and Q&A. And the um, chat function really is uh, when you type that, everybody can see what you say. So if you want to say, you know, good job, Jack, you can do that and everybody will see it. Um, if you have a question, though, something you'd like directed toward the presenters, I encourage you to use the Q&A function, which is a box you see there on the right. And when you use that, what happens is that you'll get uh, this box that will show up. And with this box, you can type in your question and answer, and it will be logged for our presenters. And um, they'll, when we get to a spot for questions and answers, they can look through those and answer them. And it can be directed to the proper presenters as well. And so um, if we were in person, if we were able to be in person today, uh, an in-person version of this, might be where you fill out index cards and you write your question there. The index card goes into a box and then we go through the cards and then we give it to the correct presenter. So um, that I encourage you to use a cute question and answer function because it's just a, a lot easier for the presenters to see what the questions are that are coming up and give us some time to answer it. And they can answer it verbally or they can choose to um, type out an answer if it's a quick thing they can do um, right there on the spot with the Q and A function. All right. Last thing is you can raise your hand. If there's something you'd like to say a comment when we get to a comment period, uh, you're welcome to raise your hand and I will go ahead and um, unmute people in the order in which they had raised their hands if they'd like to make a comment. And when we get to that portion of the evening, I'll explain how that'll work as well. All right. So um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our city manager, Mr. Alex Nguyen, who's going to go ahead and give us a presentation on what to expect for the 2021 fiscal year budget. So Alex, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you and you can share your screen. Okay. Thank you, Gabe. Uh, did you hit, there we go. Okay. Am I on? 
Yes, we see it. Okay. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, thank you for attending. And of course, uh, INCO, thank you for organizing and then also uh, giving us the time to go through this year's budget presentation. So on the screen, everyone can see the piggy bank. Yes? yes. No? Okay. Everybody sees that. So just so you know, this piggy bank, and can you see my green arrow circling the piggy bank? Yes. Okay. The piggy bank is to scale because that's all the money we have. So I'm gonna, here's a quick outline. I'm gonna give you the big picture. We will do a very quick uh, budgeting 101 refresher to remind people uh, regarding municipal budgets. I would do a recap of the last or the present fiscal year, 2019-20, which ends at the end of this month, cover some of the progress we've made and where we were at the mid-year. Then we will talk about the forecast um, for this year and next year, as well as the actual budget recommendations. And then I'm gonna end with our goals and talk about the future. So here's the big picture. So let me, um, and this is, I understand this is a very busy screen, but it really helps us with the story. So I'm actually going to start at the very right-hand side here where you have the sun shining down on Oxnard. This is always our goal, which is to achieve budget sustainability. So we can have all the proper services, especially the core services in the city, uh, such as fully staffed public safety, properly maintained medians, trees and parks, make sure that our 911 response times are solid, uh, keeping up with road maintenance, as well as being in a position to actually respond to disasters like the one that we're currently in. And you can see here, and I'm gonna talk about this very openly at the end, that my recommendation will be to ask the public for a sales tax increase. But overall, the goal to achieve sunshine in Oxnard is, is to um, get a, to a place where we are financially sustainable. Now, going back to the left-hand side, where we were, this time last year, as many of you who, who pay a lot of attention to what goes on at City Hall, remember we had a budget deficit of $9.2 million. The council made cuts up to um, of 5.3 million. And uh, we were projecting uh, coming into this new fiscal year, only a $2 million fund deficit, which is a significant improvement from 9.2 million. And at the mid-year, we were actually uh, in, in a uh, relatively stable spot and we were prepared to propose a so-called status quo budget, which for this coming year, which meant no necessary reductions. Now, this red hole here depicts uh, where Oxnard is in terms of just being level. I wanna remind everyone, we were in this hole before the coronavirus pandemic and before the recession. So going from years past to this current year, we were still working our way out of the hole and we believe we were nearing the top. Of course, the recession uh, changed everything for everybody, not just Oxnard, and it knocked us off of the effort to get out of the hole and halted uh, almost all of the progress we've been making here. So this fiscal year alone, which only has a few weeks left, we uh, have a $8.4 million loss of revenue. And this is staggering in the, in the sense that it happened over a four month period, right? For the first eight months of the year, we were doing relatively well. So instead of continuing from here, you know, working to achieve financial stability, we are now back to working at recovery. So we've got, we've got a certain revenue loss for this fiscal year and going into the next fiscal year with this new budget, the projections are about $8 million in less revenues than, than we were expecting this time last year. So we've got, um, we, we certainly believe there's more revenue losses coming in the new year, starting July 1. There are still many unknowns with regard to both the pandemic and the economy. 
So of course, what we have to do is use the, the general fund reserve, which is, um, you know, by definition, this is the moment to use the rainy day fund. So very quickly um, about municipal budgeting. Uh, so what we call funds are essentially accounts. And when we talk about revenue, that's essentially money. Examples of a lot of uh, the kinds of city funds, general fund, which is where uh, most of the, the controversy tends to lie because it's the only place where the city council has discretion to use the dollars uh, to meet their policy goals as they represent this community. And then we have the enterprise funds, water, sewer, trash. That revenue uh, cannot be used to fund anything in the general fund and likewise with our special districts for landscaping or community facilities districts. So we have a lot of funds in the city, but the majority of them are restricted. So it's really the general fund that is debated every year when we review and propose it the following year's budget. So last year, we had revenues of just under 140 million, and we had expenses at just over 140. And as you can see, um, and we'll review this a little bit more, um, that the bulk of our revenue comes from taxes and that the bulk of our expenditures go to public safety. These pie charts that you see here pretty much look the same for every city in California to varying degrees, but public safety always gets more than half of a municipal budget. Okay, um, an easier way to understand this is uh, to look at the kinds of taxes we get. Right, so franchise tax, transient uh, occupancy, which is the hotel tax, business license, sales tax, and property tax. The non-tax revenues are a range of our various fees, but the bottom line is local government operates based on taxation, right? 77% uh, of our revenue comes from taxes. It's, that's the nature of public entities, uh, local governments especially. We are a public entity, not a private entity. So uh, describing what, uh, where tax dollars go. So the two main pots, property tax. So here's an example. There's a $300,000 property in Oxnard. It's the regular tax rate on that would, would uh, the homeowner, the property owner would pay $3,000 a year. Of that $3,000 that you send to the uh, county assessor, the city will receive $528 for that tax. So another way to see that is when you look at each dollar of property tax, the state gets over 56% of it. The county gets just over 20%. The cities get 17.6. And then there are other districts that get vetted through the county. But so in essence, we get 17.6% of property tax each year when it gets paid. Now, how much sales tax stays in Oxnard? Well, here's the same um, dollar except for sales tax. The state gets just under 4%. County gets over a percent and a half. We have 1% as the baseline and then the temporary half percent, which is uh, thanks to measure O, which does expire in March of 2029. So this chunk of the dollars of a sales tax stays in Oxnard. And then there's a half a cent for Prop 172 and a quarter for county transportation. So bottom line, right now we get one and a half of the uh, 775. So another way to understand that, if you purchase a $20 shirt in Oxnard, you will be taxed a dollar 55 on top of the 20 and the city of Oxnard gets 30 cents. Now going back to restricted revenue. So we have these various funds, right? The utilities where we have water, sewer and garbage. We get grants, there's the gas tax, uh, then there are the assessment districts and then there are bond proceeds. Regardless of how much money is in these, these funds cannot be used for general fund expenses. So these are all restricted. And then at, um, policy reminder regarding our rainy day fund. So right now we have a policy goal of 12% of our operating budget in the general fund. 
and 25% in the utility funds, the enterprise funds. This is the one that has uh, me worried. No, it should have all of us worried. All right, so again, last year, $9.2 million deficit, cut 5.3, use the reserves, in, including using some of measure O, uh, specifically to keep a fire station fully open for the year and the pack partially open for several more months. As a reminder in this city, and this, this predates my time here, but the city has been experiencing budget cuts pretty much year over year. And these circles just sort of represent proportionality in terms of the departments that have been getting cut over the years. And as you can see, the cuts are pretty much across the board over the years. So what are the consequences that we're living with when we make budget cuts year after year? And these are things everyone's aware of. We're aware of all of this. We're not proud of any of it. A lot of our staff are actually quite embarrassed by this. So overgrown medians, they're everywhere. Uh, we right now with the revenue that we have, we can get to them on average once a year when it should be once a month. We all know about um, how slow it is to keep up with our street repaving and repair. You know, we just, just to stay current, we really need uh, over $13 million a year. And actually in this current fiscal year, we can only budget 11 and a half. Uh, many of our parts look like this. Uh, we've not only st um, stopped the regular mowing, which uh, we ideally would like to be mowing once a week, we're getting to them once a month. And we also had to cut the water in, in half just because we had to save money. Cultural and community services have taken a lot of cuts over the years and it obviously most recently resulted in the Carnegie being shuttered. Uh, I, I certainly do hope that that will be reopened um, at some point in the near future. Library services have taken cuts, the PAL program, all of these youth programs and including senior services have been cut. Now, overall, community services has been cut $5 million since 2015. So just that's just a loss um, in a lowering or a reduction of actual services to the community. Police department. On the right-hand side here, you can see the list of actual positions that have been taken away from the police department over the years. On the left-hand side here, this is the one that worries me the most is our, the necessity of reassigning 13 officers from neighborhood policing back to regular patrol. And um, this, is, this is an area where I believe it is our most effective, most positive and best opportunity to continue to improve police and community relations uh, here in Oxnard, but certainly anywhere else in the country. So I'm uh, the chief and I hope that we can get back on track financially and restore and even expand neighborhood policing. Oh, where's the fire? I think I lost the fire. Okay, we'll get to the fire. All right. Now, it wasn't a terrible year um, because uh, certainly um, we've made a lot of progress in this last year. S financial management, uh, significant improvements. So after, after many years, we were finally able to launch the financial portal on the city's website. And you can get, there's a button to get there from the city's homepage that allows you to easily view all the funds and accounts in the city. Um, so if you really want to dive in, not just the general fund, but the enterprise funds, all the information is there. And you can, you can uh, dice it and slice it and view it in so many different ways, bar graphs, pie charts, line graphs, there's so many ways to look at the information. So it is all there and it is constantly updated. This year was the first year that the city's auditor, um, after going through our books, came back and for the first time since 2014, they found no new material weaknesses. So that's been an area of significant concern for many years and we've made just tremendous progress this past year alone. s and revised uh, standard and poor's revised its outlook for us uh, from stable to positive which is a a good step to be taking they didn't uh, upgrade our actual grade yet but it's a signal that they're preparing to 
And they sent us, I believe it was a nine page memo discussing this and what was uh, uh, wonderful for me to read was they didn't focus on the finances so much as on the stability of the organization, the improvement of the various um, processes in the finance department and stability of political leadership. So that all leads to us being able to refinance our gas tax bonds to save money. And this is good for, I think the life of this bond is another 18 years, but the ability to refinance it uh, means that we are paying for those bonds. We're paying $400,000 less each year for those repayments. So that's, that's significant. And then the auditors also sent me a letter of encouragement and just basically let me know that the city is really on a good path now. And they commended us for the stability, uh, both in management and leadership, but also the efforts at, at improving transparency with the community. In the area of economic development, we've made some progress here as well. So um, I had proposed to the city council that uh, we, we were sitting on credits at the Public Utilities Commission uh, to underground power lines, but we didn't have any projects on deck to use that money. And we didn't, and because it wasn't enough money to do any major projects and given our dire circumstances with cash, uh, I made the recommendation that we sell those credits to another city that would be needing it. Now in that market, uh, you only get 55 cents to the dollar. Uh, but, but again, these are credits. This wasn't, um, it's not real money unless you go and, and, and do a project. So it wasn't like money that we had in our bank. So this turned out to be a, a good move to make uh, a, because it got us, $1.77 million into the general fund. And B, because given the recent um, issue surrounding wildfires across the state, the Public Utilities Commission has been having uh, serious discussions about sweeping all these accounts out to, to have those funds be used for uh, replacing uh, the PG&E and perhaps even some of the Edison major power lines to, to help prevent uh, wildfires going forward. The other thing we've done is we've been negotiating with a couple of billboards companies to bring uh, perhaps four billboards to our uh, 101 highway corridor. Now, if the uh, permits are approved by the planning commission and recommended to the council, and if the council ends up approving these, uh, it, would, it would gain us $550,000 a year for the general fund, and that's the minimum. That's the guaranteed amount. In the negotiations, we may actually make some additional income each year, depending on their business, how well they do. But the $550,000 would be new revenue to the general fund, and that's a guaranteed minimum if these billboards are approved. The city has finalized uh, its cannabis policy, and, and I know that was taking quite some time. Um, the, the city had a go slow approach just to make sure we were learning from surrounding communities and making the best policy possible. Good news is we've done that. And in addition to manufacturing and distribution, we also made significant strides with uh, retail dispensaries. And right now that process is underway. I believe we have received approximately 50 applications and we are looking forward to going, uh, completing that application process. And at the end of it, we should be looking at releasing eight permits uh, in the coming year. So we will be seeing some cannabis revenue coming to our city. Uh, I still do not believe that it's going to be the magic bullet that everyone uh, thinks it would be, um, certainly not going to be impactful to a city of our size as compared to um, some smaller cities nearby. We act, uh, in terms of investing in South Oxnard, we came up with um, a concept for establishing a, a business, a community benefits district along the Saviors Corridor, and we were working hard um, to get the property owners there to get on board. Unfortunately, the, the pandemic and the recession has put that to a halt. Downtown, 
also we were making tremendous progress with a major and, and qualified and finance developer to launch what would be the first um, large and, and essentially the catalyst project that we've needed for downtown for so long. Likewise there, unfortunately, the recession has put a halt to that. Sakioka Farms, that large uh, 400 plus acre property out there by the 101 between uh, Rice and Del Norte. So after um, uh, eight years of, of uh, effort, we actually finalized uh, the landowner's development map for that large property. And in fact, I believe next week we're also entertaining the uh, development agreement. So after a long time of that land uh, being poised for development, we've cleared uh, a lot of the hurdles with the landowners and with a potential developer out there. We've been working in parallel to get development going out there. And I'm just, I'm really looking forward to getting this across the finish line this summer. And finally, on economic development, the city council uh, was confronted with a very difficult choice uh, uh, about in, in updating and hence increasing our development impact fees, some of which had not been updated since 1972. And this was a, if any of you watched that meeting, this was a very, very difficult decision for the council to make because on the one hand, it is crucial, it's necessary, uh, our fee structure was woefully outdated. And what it meant was on the one hand, developers were getting a sweet deal here in Oxnard over the years. And on the other hand, when they weren't paying those fees, we had to come behind them and make up for, for some of the work that had to be done. Uh, so that, that's just not fair to us as a, as a city organization. Uh, this was difficult because had these fees been updated routinely every several years, and they would have been updated uh, most likely uh, to just to match inflation, rather than waiting decades and forcing the council to make a difficult decision about um, some enormous um, increases. So the council very wisely uh, said to the staff, okay, we understand, but you got to slow it down. So what they came back to us with was, okay, but you've got to phase these in. These this can't happen all at once. So it, it was a difficult uh, decision point for them. And um, so I understand that and I should actually apologize to them. Okay, uh, capital improvement projects. Uh, we made some, some progress there too. Last year, we actually completed 19 projects that were just over $27 million in value. Um, there's a few here that are highlighted, uh, street resurfacing. So I think the ones that are obvious are um, Channel Islands Boulevard, Vineyard Ave, and out at the Auto Center, that was over $7 million. We finally replaced the rooftops at two of our fire stations. We replaced um, iron pipe, cast iron piping, uh, in Bryce Canyon, north and south in the Fremont North neighborhood. Uh, and so there's still more work to be done there across the city. We completed $6 million worth of emergency repairs at the sewer plant and uh, worked on a very difficult traffic signal out at Rose Ave and Gary Drive. And this was, um, I know it looks silly to, to say, you know, that one traffic, traffic signal was, was an accomplishment, but this one, had a lot of issues around it regarding ADA challenges, engineering challenges, and it was, an, it was a particular signal that was brought to our attention in need of upgrades because of the necessity for ADA uh, passage for st uh, students at a school near there. So that was, so staff is very proud that that was completed. In terms of quality of life, we're still making good progress there. Um, the crime in the city, and I think many of you have heard our police chief talk about this, has been declining uh, for a fourth year in a row. So for 2019, our, we saw a drop of nearly 15% of crime in the city. Homelessness, we actually made progress uh, for the first time in a long time uh, through all of our various efforts, our 
number of unsheltered homeless uh, folks in the community actually decreased by 76 people. And for the homeless, uh, the annual point in time counts, um, we actually had an increase in the overall count of only 19, which is a, a much better number than the years prior. So all the, all the difficult and controversial hard work around homelessness is slowly, slowly taking effect. Uh, we continue pursuing grants and there's a highlight here of a grant we received from the state specifically for Campus Park. So we received an eight and a half million dollar fund to actually begin uh, physical improvements to the park. And this will be the first um, uh, real bucket of money and, and the opportunity to have this begin uh, for nearly 20 years at Campus Park. The, or, oops, sorry, going back, the Ormond Beach Power Plant. The city council approved an agreement between the city and Genon, the company that owns the power plant down there. This agreement, uh, on the one hand, it, it would give the power plant an extra two years to operate. Um, and in return, they will uh, deposit for us into a trust fund, $25 million, and they're gonna make monthly deposits. So we're not gonna get the 25 million upfront, we're gonna get it between now and 2023, but it will go into a trust fund to be used solely to dismantle the power plant at Ormond Beach. So we have the signed agreement that the city council approved and with us and Genon. And on July 21st, the state water board will review it and they will make their final decision. So all indication is that the staff at the water board is supportive of this agreement and we expect the water board to approve it. Um, the meetings on July 21st, I will speak uh, most likely through Zoom, like, like we're doing here. Uh, if for any reason the, they're opening the meeting uh, to have it in person, then I will go to Sacramento and testify on behalf of Oxnard. We've also uh, paid attention uh, um, a different idea in South Oxnard. We had a concept to create a Zocalo at Center Point Mall. We'd worked with the mall owners and gotten them on board and actually quite excited about the possibility. Again, the pandemic and the recession has put that to a halt, but I've been staying in touch with the owners and they are still very interested in pursuing that um, as soon as it's economically possible, uh, which means as soon as this recession uh, starts to recover. And finally, the council also recently approved uh, the city's broadband fiber infrastructure plan. And the plan is actually set out to leverage private investment to uh, basically light up our, our fiber network throughout the city and offer better and higher inter internet speed access to businesses and residents. We also made uh, some progress in correcting past errors. We um, council approved a contract with a new management company, a golf course management company at the golf course to eliminate city subsidies. And in the first eight months of this year, they were actually doing, of this fiscal year, they were doing quite well. Um, pandemic recession set them back, but uh, for whatever reasons, uh, the, the, the segment of the community most itching to end the stay-at-home order uh, were golfers. So as soon as the county um, lifted the prohibition on golf courses, uh, golf course started filling up again. So perhaps they'll recover faster than the rest of us. The council also approved an agreement with Sterling Venue uh, Ventures to operate the Performing Arts Center without city subsidies. Uh, as soon as we uh, signed that contract, uh, the pandemic and the recession hit. And um, there's, no, there's no predicting, uh, even when the state and the county lift the, the restrictions of those sorts of entertainment gatherings, there's no predicting when the community at large will feel comfortable packing into a theater. Uh, the good news is we've also remained in touch with the operator. They have no... Um, concern about walking away from the contract. 
Uh, they're committed to, to staying here and working through this recession. They're also um, thinking about ways to provide um, outdoor drive-in movie experiences in the parking lot. So we're working with them uh, for those ideas. And by the way, in South Oxnard, the owners of Cinepoint Mall are also very interested in providing that kind of amenity for the community. So we may see uh, sometime this summer drive-in theater movie experiences again here in Oxnard, which is a good way to have that kind of gathering and yet keep people safe from spreading the virus. Uh, we made some more progress in terms of improving government accountability and ethics. And uh, I'm, I'm very honored that I think it was 82% uh, passage from our voters. So that was good news. Uh, finally, the ERP, I think many of you have heard about this controversy over the last few years, but it's essentially the, the, the central brain slash nervous system of the city's computer software program. And we've been using a program that was started in the 80s, a software program, and it's just, it's just it had become antiquated for this organization. So we finally um, got into a contract for a new program and that will be launching. It's actually already starting. So that is going to do wonders for us, uh, both in terms of how much staff time it takes to, to do what we're doing now, reduce the, the opportunities of human error, and actually helps in, in terms of transparency because this system will also feed the dashboards that we have online for people to see our finances. Streamlining our permit process. We went through a very painful process interviewing uh, past clients, customers, developers uh, who were very unhappy with the city's process to walk through with them their case file to learn exactly where the bottlenecks were, where the roadblocks were, where the redundancies were, where the unnecessary uh, bureaucracy was. And then we just worked with them to improve the process. And so we've made tremendous strides there. And, and we're already getting feedback from, from people working with our shop these days, uh, telling us that they're impressed by how fast they're getting through the process. And then just as a reminder for everyone there, I am certain that there are still undiscovered landmines in terms of prior problems that have not arisen yet. Last year, in my first year in Oxnard, I, I stepped on a few. Uh, I actually have my foot on one right now that I've got to figure out how to how to fix. Uh, and I'm sure there'll be a few more. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't matter because as soon as we learn about it, we just need to address it head on. All right, so at the mid-year, uh, we were projecting that we would finish the year with um, only a $2 million operating budget and hence we would be able to propose to the council a status quo budget in the sense that we could, we could survive the $2 million deficit and continue to make progress and not have a budget this year with cuts and reductions. Well, unfortunately that didn't happen uh, given this pandemic and the recession. So this fiscal year alone, and, and this is primarily the last four months of the fiscal year, uh, again, which ends June 30, we're down $8.4 million. And, and so this is the bulk of this is not a projection. It's, it's money that didn't come. So at sales tax, uh, you can see there over 3 million, hotel tax 1.6, uh, our various other revenues down 3.7. The hotel tax here, you know, it shows down 30%, but that's for the entire fiscal year. But the truth is, in the last three months alone, I think it's been down, you know, over 80% at all of our hotels in terms of their business. So this is this is really going to hurt us in the new fiscal year starting July 1, because there's no predicting when that uh, segment of the economy is going to come back to the levels that it was pre-pandemic. So uh, the main considerations for, for assembling this budget that we're going to propose to the council next week. Uh, first and foremost, we really don't have a choice. We're gonna have to utilize our reserve. Again, by definition, these are the rare moments when you dip into your rainy fund, uh, you know, your rainy day fund. So that's where we are. Uh, we're in the process of asking employees to freeze future increases. Um, at this point, I think that will, that could sock an additional uh, 1.3 million back into our reserve. 
we are freezing uh, almost all hiring. Now, there, and the reason it says most here and not all is because there are some positions that perform mandated work that we're going to have to continue to fill. There, there's, you, you just can't um, not perform some of that work. Uh, we continue to scrub our contracts and various memberships. We've been doing this for years, so I don't expect a whole lot of savings there. Um, we did have to, when the pandemic hit uh, uh, in March, we had to lay off the part-time employees in large part because they couldn't perform the work that they were here to do. And unfortunately, we had just spun up a new fire academy. And because of the pandemic, we couldn't provide the actual academy training because so much of it is physical and hands-on and in, in close proximity. Um, so we had to terminate the fire academy just as it was starting. Uh, so that's a couple hundred thousand dollars in savings. It isn't significant enough. Um, now, here's something that the council took action also at the last meeting that was that was seemingly controversial, but I'm here to tell you it is not. So we we received authority from the council to potentially take loans from our enterprise funds. $10 million from each loan, water, sewer, and garbage. And this is strictly for cash flow. Should we be in a situation towards the end of the fiscal year where we're running out of cash? And the reason is this. During um, early on in this pandemic, the governor issued orders that allows businesses to defer pay their sales tax payments. And there were a couple of categories, uh, basically large businesses or small businesses and uh, companies could defer between 90 days uh, in I believe the large category case, they could defer for three months, a whole quarter and the rest could defer up to 12 months. So for example, if we were expecting in, in one quarter, let's say $5 million of sales tax payments because the sales, the business transacted and the sales taxes were actually paid, but the businesses took the option the governor provided for good reason, by the way, where they could hold on to those sales tax payments to use to keep their businesses afloat and not pay those, make those payments till a year from now. So even though we're supposed to receive those payments, we may not get them in time. And that's all that that loan is for. If that occurs to a, a significant amount where we need the cash, then we will actually utilize uh, what we need from the loan. So just because the council approved this last week doesn't mean that this week I took the money and put it into the general fund. We're not touching it unless and until we need it. So in my mind, it's actually more like a line of credit than, than a the uh, immediate loan. So we're not touching it unless and until we need it. And when, and if and when we have to do that, we will inform the council and the public. Uh, furloughing. So I'm right now trying to avoid that uh, in, in large part because the city is already very lean. Last year in my first Oxnard budget, I had to recommend to the council some serious cuts that included laying off 32 actual employees. That was a very, very painful and difficult thing to do. Um, and we're trying our best not to do that again. Uh, same with eliminating entire programs, because that's really where we're at with the condition that we're in in this organization. Now, I have to um, warn everyone at the next mid-year, by the end of December of this calendar year, which would be halfway through the new fiscal year, uh, we will review the, the real numbers. And in January of 21, if nothing has gotten better, we may be faced with actually making some serious eliminations from our city's programs and services. So here we are again with that reserve policy. Our policy is 12%. And this is how much we had in reserves uh, before the pandemic. This is how much we're gonna have left at the end of this fiscal year. And having to utilize it to buttress the next budget, we're gonna be left by the end of next year, our projection is with 3.4 million, which is really only a 2.2% rainy day fund. 
that is extremely thin ice and it has us extremely concerned. So whatever happens in the first six months of the fiscal year, as we see the actual uh, continued fallout of the pandemic, because again, we don't know when the pandemic itself actually ends. Therefore, we certainly don't know when the recession is going to begin a genuine recovery. So, and, and this is the predicament for all cities and states. It is this, this has nothing to do with anything we've done here in Oxnard in terms of the current conditions. Now, to be, to be fair and frank and honest, our health and our condition as an organization coming into uh, this pandemic was very, very weak. So some of you've probably heard me say, we're like a city that had underlying conditions before this pandemic hit. So we were not in the best of shape to be confronted by such a crisis. And that is definitely on us. So um, here is the actual budget proposal that I will be presenting to the council next week. And it's actually quite simple because there are now not many moving parts. I don't believe this to be nearly as controversial as it was last year. So I'm going to review for you the items uh, over $100,000 in change, because that's where it gets significant. So city clerk's office will need an increase of $112,000, and that's for the general election, the election in November. All cities have to pay into the county to cover their portion of the cost to, for the county to conduct the November election. So this is not unique to us. Community development is going to be able to, between freezing uh, well, from freezing their, their um, hiring, uh, but they're also facing at least a $200,000 revenue reduction. That's their projection. They'll be saving us about $400,000 uh, for the next fiscal year. In public works, they'll be able to save us $900,000 in the general fund, primarily by moving engineering staff from the general fund projects over to the enterprise fund projects. And this is a very um, pragmatic thing to do. We don't have new money in the general fund for any major projects, and we actually have major projects in the utility funds, the enterprise funds. So there's no need to, to fire the engineers we have in the general fund and then go and try to hire engineers for the utility fund. So we've got good, great people on staff now, so we'll move them over, utilize their time uh, for the projects we have going on and upcoming at the um, utilities. Fire department. So um, here's what we're gonna propose. Number one, we are going to redeploy paramedic staff uh, from the squad back to the fire engines. And um, so they'll still be able to provide paramedic services, but they will be part of the, the larger trucks. They won't be in their own uh, squad vehicles. Now that is the paramedic squad is something we added uh, just a few years ago to enhance service because the fire chief believed that uh, that's what the community needs. Uh, I fully agree with him, uh, but uh, at this point it's enhan an enhanced service that we just can't afford. So that will save us um, $876,000. However, I've made the decision here that I'm going to begin to structurally fix the fire department's annual budget by increasing the station coverage fund by a million dollars because year after year, um, they come in over budget and it's just, and, and we've recently had the overtime audit that looked at that and, it, and they, um, and this also, this report will be at the city council next week and they came back and said, well, your, your departments and your overtime usage is in line with other uh, cities. So this is um, going to end up as a net increase for the fire department's annual budget of $124,000. Police will be also making some serious, because actually the, the largest cuts uh, for this fiscal year. So number one, um, Revenue is down $400,000 due to the school district's cancellation of their contract for our officers on their campuses. 
completely uh, understandable from the perspective of the financial hardship that the school district is undergoing uh, both prior and post pandemic. We're also going to be eliminating uh, a total of 17 positions. 11 of them are sworn officer positions. They're currently vacant. Um, so there won't, we won't be sending any bodies out the door there. And then there are six non-sworn positions uh, that the department will be restructuring. Um, we are fortunate, uh, well, to be fair from the city's perspective that there are other positions that these individuals can bump into. Uh, I'm sure that they themselves are not excited. Uh, that combined will save the general fund $1.4 million. And that, those are the significant changes for, uh, that we're proposing in this fiscal year. So here again is the similar chart from last year. Uh, we're projecting $135 million in revenue. And again, there are your major buckets. And here are our expenses, which is 140.8, which means we will be dipping into the reserves for another 5.8. Um, Again, disclaimer, uh, halfway through the fiscal year, we will have uh, more real economic data. We will know where the pandemic is and where the recession is. And we may uh, have to change course, uh, it, whether it's mildly or even severely. Uh, there, it is truly a time of uncertainty. And speaking of uncertainty, Lots of discussion about a potential bailout. I actually just reviewed an update today from Washington about the various debates going on um, regarding what the next federal uh, stimulus package would look like and would local government be part of it. Uh, in any event, they're trying to delay having that vote until the, um, the end of July, I believe. So bottom line is, um, if we get any form of a federal bailout for local government, these things matter. How much is it? What is the form is it? Is it a true bailout? Is it a grant? Is it a loan? Is it a reimbursement program? The form that it, that it takes really impacts us um, as, as much as the amount. And also, when would this happen? Uh, a month ago, I was hopeful that Washington um, would be able to resolve this before cities and states went into their budget process. Uh, clearly, that's not going to happen. But the bottom line on the right-hand side of this slide, regardless of a federal bailout, number one, if it's not basically $17 million or more, it's not going to change this particular budget that I'm proposing. And the reason is that $17 million represents loss of revenue. It doesn't represent anything we did wrong. It's loss of revenue. And because we're sucking it at a phenomenal rate out of our reserve, my recommendation to the city council would be, if we were to get an actual grant from the feds, would be to restore the reserve immediately and not to spend it on anything else. Now, number two on this slide here, on the right-hand side, any bailout is a one-time injection of money and it would not resolve our actual fiscal problem in this organization with this city. So yes, it would be wonderful to get a government bailout if it's an actual grant, meaning we don't have to pay them back and if it's actually $17 million or more, I will dance in the streets. But that would be a quick dance because it won't last very long because our structural, our financial structural problem has been with us and would stay with us unless we change course. So having said that, I'm going, so that's the budget presentation by the way, but I'm going to share with you uh, openly and publicly that I, am very likely going to ask the city council in July to consider putting on the ballot in November sales tax increase. As it's not, there's not, first of all, I'm not 100% certain I'm gonna do that, but I wanna talk about these things early, although people have been talking about it for quite some time, uh, because what I don't want is if I'm gonna do this in July, I don't want people to say, oh, we didn't know about this. 
well, you know, this is a surprise. So no surprise. I, I'm like 90% sure I'm going to ask. Uh, now, that's one part. What the council does would be another, uh, is, is another reality. And then if it, 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 even if it makes it on, what the voters do ultimately decide. So quick reminder, for the sales tax uh, here, we only get this much. And, and our baseline is still only one penny, 1%. The measure O, thank goodness for that, expires in the spring of 2029. Now here's the actual sales tax bracket in California. There is a statewide minimum and a statewide maximum. So we in Oxnard are at the minimum. Our base sales tax rate is still 7.25, which matches the minimum. There are roughly 30 cities in California that have already gone to the 10. There are 130 cities or so that have gone to the nines, uh, equal number that have gone to the eights, and we're, we're down here. Now, here's why this really, really matters. It's not, it's not just a question of how much money each of these would generate for you. That varies from city to city depending on the overall wealth of the community and the cost of living and, and so on. But this space here that we leave could be crowded out by the state or the county. And that's a really, really significant concern for me, which would mean the sales tax money generated by our local businesses and by uh, not only our residents, but visitors, tourists, uh, people who don't live here, but work here, but spend money here. Those are all sources of people who pay sales tax in Oxnard. The sales tax is not only paid for by Oxnard residents. But if, if we don't start to crowd out the state and keep any amount over that, any amount over the six, the, the combined 6% that, um, that the state basically takes away, any amount over that stays here. So again, right now, only this much stays in Oxnard. We have the, the legal um, right and ability to um, utilize the rest of the space in the sales tax bracket. And anything that, are, that we utilize in this bracket stays in Oxnard. It does not go to the state or the county. So if our revenue pictures don't change, what we have today is what we have. The city's been through um, almost relentless cuts and reductions. We've had our books audited up and down, not only by our auditors, but the um, uh, Sacramento has had to review our books. Here is a phenomenal um, budget presentation I found. I believe this was probably the 2014-15 year. Um, I think that's the, the one this was. Now, I want to draw your attention to this. This was a basically a 10-year forecast. Yeah, this is this is the year. Um, I think for this of the 16 million dollar loan. All right. The, but this is the 10-year forecast for the city of Oxnard. Now, I want you to look at this. The first there are two rows uh, I've highlighted here. The first one is just the overall uh, deficit, operating deficit. And you're looking at, at basically a decade's worth of forecasting deficit spending year after year after year through uh, 23 and 24. And to achieve that, you would have had to make the following cuts these years. And we are talking about double digit million dollar cuts to the city's uh, operating budget year after year. This, this is a financial forecast to end the city. I, I, don't, I, I, I just cannot understand um, how, how you can have this without a plan to, to really course correct. But this is, this is where we've been and in part, it explains where we're at. So this is what I would be asking uh, of the city council to place on the November ballot. 
So here you see the, the, the sales tax minimum, seven and a quarter, and that's our base. So that's where we are. This line here is the Steve Oxnard's um, regular sales tax rate. We are at the, at the minimum. With measure O, again, thank goodness we have it, it puts us up here at this gray line at seven and three quarters. Now, understanding that it ends after the first quarter of 2029, we would be back at the bottom. So what I'm asking for is a penny and a half increase. And if, if it gets put on the ballot in November, and if the voters approve it, it would take us to nine and a quarter for the duration of measure O. Um, mind you, we're still not in this territory, but it puts us up here. And then after Measure O sunsets um, in the spring of 2029, it'll bring us back to 8.75. So essentially puts us roughly in the middle of the, of the bracket. Now, I still um, admire those cities that are up here because what they've done is they've guaranteed that the state will never take uh, those tax dollars away from them but clearly we're not in that situation. But it's important if we're going to turn this city around, uh, it's important to get to right size our revenue versus our expenses. And I know there, there are plenty of complaints about, oh, you know, you gotta control your expenses better. You gotta do more economic development. All of those things are true and we're working on all those things. But in the end, <clears throat> this government, like all other governments are run by taxes. So there is no way to have to, to perform economic development out of this problem. And if you think about it, when, when our city uh, looks like this, it really makes it more difficult to attract new investment. So if we don't turn our, our financial uh, situation around, we won't escape this forecast here of continued cuts and continued deficit spending. And we will, we will have to cut major, major programs just to find a way to balance the budget each year. But it, means, it would mean a serious reduction of so many things that this community holds dear in terms of the programs and services that we can provide. So again, going back to this part of the big picture, our goal uh, and, and this was, by the way, the goal prior to the pandemic and prior to the recession. This is always our goal, get back to financial sustainability so we can provide the core services at the levels that everybody wants and that we, the staff, want to deliver. Again, I know it's, it's terrible timing, but we don't have a choice. Like I said, we, we were um, or are a city with underlying conditions and we got hit by this pandemic and this recession, and we, we've got to work extra hard now to recover, but we also need beyond recovery, we need to get to a place of stability. So Gabe, with that, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Thank you for giving me the patience for making a long budget presentation. Uh, we have, again, as a reminder, the police chief, the fire chief, and the CFO are all here to answer questions, as am I. Thank you, Gabe. Great, thank you again, Alex. Really appreciate the presentation and um, for you taking the time to present it to the general public. So we have a number of questions that came in. Some of them actually were sent in ahead of time. And so um, uh, I have put those, if, if you see them when we answer them, it'll show it's from me, but I really just copied and pasted them. They were sent to uh, the email address that you got when you registered. So a couple of them, I was trying to group them up because there are a few that are um, uh, common questions. I think the first one here though is regards to the sales tax you were just talking about. And I'll just read it as it's asked. It says, is there a significant sales tax increase on the table? We just talked about that. Is there a water utility increase planned? How does the city expect citizens to be burdened with this when many are just getting by? prior to this and um, already at individual financial peril? So I, I fully understand and appreciate that question. Um, but like I said, we're, we're, this is, I mean, I acknowledge this is terrible timing, but it's a situation where if we don't do this, the city only gets worse. We're not, we're not, uh, when I look at 
both the history of the city and, and the, the financial situation of the city, what I'm telling everyone is this is necessary because it, it doesn't get better. It, it's bad, really bad in some instances, and it's only going to get worse. So um, again, uh, it isn't just us that pays, who live here that pays the sales tax, but so do many other people who either visit here or work here but don't live here. So the, the burden of it is not entirely on us. Um, but again, I would not be recommending this or, or contemplating this if I did not believe that it was necessary. All right, thank you for that. Um, next question we have here uh, is again in regards to the economic impact that we've had. And it says, aside from the impact of COVID-19, what other items impacted the decline in our revenues? Are you, was the question for what other declines uh, or what were the reasons? Yes. Well, the way it's worded is, um, aside from the impact of COVID-19, what other items impacted the decline in revenues? Oh, no, that's it. In terms of, in terms of this fiscal year and the last um, uh, three and a half, well, the last four years of this fiscal year, it's, it's entirely, entirely the pandemic and the recession. And again, it affected everyone. So for, from the perspective of the pandemic, um, with regard to um, government budgets, uh, it, it, it impacted everybody. And, and as a reminder, even the state is forecasting a $54 billion loss of revenue uh, for their uh, budget that they revised in May. And that's billion with a, as in boy. Okay, the next one is a pretty quick question. It says, is, is Sakioka Farms part of SOAR? No, it is not. All right, figured that was a quick and easy one. So the next couple ones are kind of um, around uh, landscaping, some public works ones. And so um, I'll start with uh, one that had to do with uh, streets. Um, how much is, how much does Oxnard invest in street repairs during 2019-2020? That was on the slide. We're just over $11 million in the street budget. All right. And, and it's obviously it's insufficient. All right. Um, and then let's see, there was another one about Campus Park. Sorry. Okay. Is the city, what is the city planning to do with the old Oxnard High School or Campus Park in the near future? Is the 2021 budget allocating funding to start construction of the park that has been promised for years? So um, I don't uh, know that there are real plans with the high school. Uh, and in terms of the money for the park, um, I mentioned it in the presentation, we did receive an eight and a half million dollar grant from the state specifically to begin improvements of the park. So we're starting that process. Okay, so that probably answers the follow up that one which says with the eight and a half million dollars, where does campus park stand up to date with the changes that have been made with funding? What will be implemented with the support of funding in the future? What is our timeline for finalizing Campus Park? And it sounds like that's still kind of in, in motion. Is that correct? Uh, well, no, I, I can answer that. So first of all, the, 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 that question, all the elements of that question combined is really a big picture question. Like when, you know, how long is it gonna take? How much money? And when is it gonna actually be complete? So to be very clear about it, so we do have the eight and a half million dollar grant. And again, that's restricted. Right, so we cannot take that money and use it anywhere else for anything else. So that's for Campus Park. We're starting that process and there's a little bureaucracy with the state because it's, it's a state parks grant and we have to do a map and we have to do you know, some things, but that money will begin the process. It's again, specifically for Campus Park. Now, it's hard, it's, you know, it's a large property, eight and a half million is not gonna get a whole lot done, but you know, goodness sakes, it's, it's, a, it's a solid tangible beginning. Now, following up on that, as I sit here today, there's no money to continue that work. 
right now. Now, if we're if we're uh, fortunate to continue to get grant funding for that, that would that would continue. But if our if our financial picture doesn't change, there is no money to to add to that grant. Okay. Um, I think this is one of the last ones regarding the public works types things. So this one asks, is there consideration to deferring CIP or capital improvement projects that are not funded by grant money to help uh, bridge the near, sh near term shortfall? Right. Well, number one, we don't have CIP projects in the general fund this coming year. We just, because we don't have the money, but if, if there's something that was grant funded, again, that would have been a restricted uh, fund. So if, if, if we have grant funding, we should go ahead and do the projects, whatever they are. And we should, we should spend grant money uh, as, you know, hopefully as soon as you get it, you start spending it. It's not a good practice to sit on grant money. Yeah, absolutely. All right, uh, these next couple ones are going back to the sales tax increase. Um, where does the sales tax go into for the city? And does it go into the general fund? Yes. All right. And then um, can the increased sales tax increase, I'm sorry, can the sales tax increase be retained for our city? Uh, if not, what other tax would be retained only for city use? I think what they're asking is, if the voters pass the one and a half cents, does, does all of that go to the city? I think that's what they're asking. Yes, absolutely. The state doesn't get to grab that. Okay. And uh, the next one, uh, it's similar to the first one we had, um, but it does bring up uh, another part of it. Of the allowable sales tax rates, which cities are at which percentage? Um, I think that means, you know, who, who else has their own kind of uh, city or municipal sales tax rate on top of the state rate. And could we share this as public information, please? Yes. So what, uh, if, if, I'm, if I get to the um, discussion uh, in, in early July about the sales tax, I'm going to provide a lot more detail like that. But the bottom line is, if you remember that slide where I showed all those cities that are above the minimum, right? They, anything above that, they keep. So again, the, the, the state keeps the base amount, which is I think six cents, right? Seven, no, no, six and a quarter goes to the state, I believe. Um, cities get the one, the penny, and that's hence your minimum in the bracket. So anything that you uh, approve above that, you get to keep. And that's my whole point. If we don't, if we don't start to, to take, uh, crowd out the state in, from that space, they could come in. And would this make us the highest sales tax rate in the county? Uh, in the county, you know, it might. I, I, I don't have the data right in front of me. It might, but here's the thing. Um, and this, again, we're gonna have a more robust discussion about this. Uh, we, we will survive that in terms of economics, right? But not to mention, we need it. And, and some of our neighboring cities have higher property tax values than we do. So it's, it's, I, I'm, I'm much less concerned about that comparison than I am about our, our A, our fiscal condition, and B, the potential for the state to crowd us out there. Okay. And I think that um, based on the questions we've seen here, that may be something for uh, the public to consider because the rest of the question does read, the increase of sales tax would impact many who are at minimum wage or below a living wage and already burdened with paying more than those who are at higher income brackets. So, all right, well, thank you for that, Alex. Um, we have a couple questions in regards to the police department now and the police department's um, uh, budget. And so let's see, uh, the first one is, uh, was there an increase or there was an increase uh, in the police department's budget from the adopted 1920 fiscal year? Uh, what was this for and or what was this used for and how did that happen? Hi, Gabe, it's Scott Whitney. Hi, Jack. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Um, that 159,000 was from the salary increases, the uh, adopted MOU that the union got. Uh, 
that was uh, mid-year. So that's what it was for. All right. Um, how much money will be allocated to Oxnard PD for the 2021 budget? Uh, it's 62.8 million. It was in the report, but that's what it is. Okay. And then um, this one was touched on in the report and maybe Chief Whitney, you might have um, an idea about the mechanics of this. Uh, it says, why is Oxnard PD charging money to schools for a service that residents must receive from this agency at no cost? Right, so uh, essentially the, the short answer is it's for enhanced services. Um, this is common in, in uh, most cities, uh, schools, if they did not have, if they didn't uh, pay for the school resource officer, the officer would go back to patrol and then uh, the officers would respond to the schools when they had calls, as opposed to having a, an officer on campus at all time. Okay, so it's specific, it's a service specific to the school district or those. Right, schools. right. It's very common. All right. Uh, the next one, uh, why is there a need to increase budget for police if crime is down 14.9%? Yeah, our budget's not going up. We're taking a budget cut. Okay, would you say that the um, level of service that Oxnard PD is providing, um, do you think that that influences the crime rate going up and down or staying steady? Um, yeah, definitely. Definitely. We um, affect the crime rate by good police work, essentially you focus in on the offenders, you focus in on where the crime's happening, you have good relationships with the community, they help you solve crime. So yes. Okay. Um, let's see, there was another one here. Uh, why do police get a bigger percentage of money than firefighters? We live in Southern California and fires are a yearly occurrence. And I'm not sure if Chief Whitney, Chief Darwin, or Alex want to address that one. Yeah, I can. It, it's probably comparable in Oxnard to uh, what it is in other cities. It's, it's you know, all cities, no matter what the service, it's, it's based on the demand. And, uh, and Oxnard isn't particularly hit with the wildfires. So the budget that helps, and, and, and good evening, everybody, and thanks for moderating this, Gabe. So the budget that helps offset, uh, the money that offsets our budget as we go into wildland fires are through FEMA grant or FEMA or state funds. Um, so it doesn't necessarily um, impact the general fund, except initially, but then it gets reimbursed. All right. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Chief Whitney, there is a... Uh... Another one here, or two more regarding the police. Um, the first, so this one is, I can actually combine them and I'll just read it out. It says, regarding the police proposed budget of around $62.8 million, it was said that our budget mirrors those found in cities all across California. This was the reason given to why our proposed budget is 62.8 million. Obviously there are other reasons why but this was the only reason that was given. And if this is a primary reason, then how does Oxnard compare in terms of crime rates with other similar budgets? Can you direct us to the police department's proposed budget as I can't find it anywhere on the Oxnard website? And then I know it's a multi, multiple point question. Sorry about that. But final point, $62.8 million makes our deficit look like a cakewalk. And obviously we understand it's not free money, but how is it not possible to slash more money from such a big expense? Gabe, you asked a lot of questions there. <laughs> I think I'm um, going back to the first part um, here. Um, the, how does the Oxnard PD budget uh, reflect other cities of similar sizes? Right. And, um, how does our crime rate look that way too in relation to the size of the budget? So other cities are size, it, it's probably because there's not a lot of cities our size and, and uh, the ones that are out there, you know, some there, there's kind of different demographics and different um, sizes of budgets. Um, so our budget is probably we, with this cut in officers, we're going to have the same number of officers that we had in 
in 2010. Um, so I would say that the number of officers we had was, you know, right about like an adequate level. Uh, when I was in the city manager's office several years ago, I would say that the number of police officers we had was adequate. And the number of firefighters we had was, you know, inadequate. Um, and so the, the cut of the 11 officers is definitely, we're going to, we're, we're going to feel that, not immediate, but we will feel that. So I would say our staffing levels are probably just uh, with this cut, probably a little below where we want to be. Uh, Crime-wise, it's, it's the same. I, I tell people this is a safe city. Oxnard is a big city. We, we uh, have our challenges, um, but it, it compares well with cities our size. All right, thank you. And um, the last two here for Oxnard PD. Um, earlier you said 63 million for the Oxnard PD budget, but the report says 75 million, which I believe is the full budget, proposed budget that came out yesterday. And maybe you'd like to address the kind of discrepancy in that. I think it's the bottom line versus the general fund is the question there. Yeah, I was probably referring to the general fund. I was looking at the uh, presentation that Alex gave that was on the general fund. Um, there are other, um, I don't have those numbers with me right now. I haven't actually seen them myself, but there are many, many other funds uh, within the city. This, this presentation focused on the general fund. All right, great, thank you. And um, how is the 62.8 million from the general fund utilized by Oxnard PD? What does most of that go to, I think, is the question. Right, so, with any uh, police department, probably most of the departments in the city, with the exception of utilities, um, like mid 80%, probably 85 to 88% goes to personnel because we provide you know, services. So that's the bulk of it. Um, within the police department, we have you know, the very basic people in uniform out in, out in the field. Those are patrol officers. That's the bulk of the budget. And then we have investigations and administration. So that, that's kind of in a nutshell how it's broken down. Great, thank you. Uh, I think we'll move into, I, I see there are other questions that did come in regarding police. Some of them are similar to what we already answered. However, if we didn't get to one of your questions, I am saving all of them and we'll send them to our panelists if that's okay. And we could um, easily have them answered. And for those who registered ahead of time, we have your email addresses. We can send those responses out to folks. All right, is that okay with our panelists? Their, sure. Their cameras are off, but I'm sure that they're nodding their heads yes, so. And saying yes. Okay. Uh, so next we have a fire question for Chief Base. Um, uh, the one worry I have on the forefront of my mind is regarding the Pleasant Valley Road Fire Station. Is the city considering to remove the fire engine again? No, we will not. Um, all stations will remain open and all the engines will remain staffed. So essentially what we're doing is we're taking the paramedics off the squad and putting them on, on some of the vacancies, the firefighter vacancies that we currently have. Um, right now we have 14 firefighter vacancies within the department, so they're just going to be reassigned. Um, they'll still work as paramedics and they're still going to be uh, providing that service down south of Oxnard. Great, thank you. And then, um, well, we already asked this one actually around uh, the firefighter budget in regards to Southern California fires. And I think Chief Whitney um, or uh, Chief Base, you might've mentioned that uh, for wildfires, uh, because we are um, geographically removed a little bit from the hills where that typically happens, it's not something that uh, comes up often, but it is something we're prepared for. Is that correct? Uh, that, that is correct. Not financially though, because it's gonna cost us up front, right? Um, again, we have a mutual aid program, we'll respond as far as the Oregon, California border. Um, so the general fund is gonna to have to pay for that up front. But again, like I've said, we'll, we'll receive a reimbursement. It's not always quick, but we will receive not just 100%, but 118% reimbursement for our time. Okay, thank you. So we have some kind of basic questions here around city functions and maybe um, Alex might want to um, take these. Uh, so here's one that says during the summer of 2019, 11 homes in my neighborhood had major home repairs done, 
the property owners did not pull permits to do these projects. The city not only receives revenue for permits, but are then able to ensure the work is properly completed and documented. I'm aware that some of my neighbors tried to make notification to the city, but to no avail. Wouldn't it be beneficial to the city and its residents to stay on top of permits for major work? Absolutely, yes. Uh, I, I think, uh, and this is something that happens in all cities is that there are always people who are gonna wanna do work without pulling a permit. And to be very uh, fair about the reality, sometimes uh, there are occasions when people get frustrated when they try to pull a permit. And that's where we've worked really hard to streamline the process to make it easier for people. And by the way, when we get the new um, main software system in place and up and running, we'll be able to provide some of those permits easier that people can pull online and schedule inspections online. So yeah, it's important that people pu pull permits when necessary for health and safety reasons. Uh, yes, we do get to collect the fees to recover the costs, to review the plans and to do the inspections, but it's also incumbent on us to make the process user-friendly so that it doesn't turn people away from doing the right thing. So we have responsibility in, in all those areas. But bottom line is, yeah, of course, it's better for everyone to, to um, do it the right way. Great, thank you. And another kind of staffing one, but it relates a little to the um, PD questions that we just had. Uh, why not allocate some of the police budget to social workers and housing? Over-policing increases crime rates. Okay. So um, I'll, I'll respond first, and I don't know if the chief wants to chime in. Uh, I, first of all, I'm not convinced that over-policing increases crime rates. Uh, I'll let the chief address that. Um, in my experience, I've not seen that anywhere. In terms of why not um, use the funding for something else, so I see those as really two separate things, right? And I know people look at our budget and they say, oh my God, why is so much money going to public safety? Well, it has to do with, first of all, that we are a large city and we have to have public safety services. That over the years, because of uh, certain state regulations, our, our flexible money, discretionary funds for the general funds have shrunk. So if you look um, prior to, when was Proposition um, 218, when is it, 2000? 1996. 1996, okay. So if you look at city budgets prior to 1996, including ours, by the way. So if you look at our budget for 1995 and then 1997, you can see there's a, there's a shift in the, the size of the pie of a city budget that public safety encompasses. And it isn't uh, because those departments suddenly grew so large in those years, it's because the rest of the general fund shrunk. So that's one minor explanation. Uh, but back to the, the broader point, why wouldn't we take some of the police funding for social services and, or social work and so on? Well, because you those are separate and distinct needs and it doesn't, it doesn't help us to, to make one set of services worse in addressing a need in another area and specific to social services. And this is an area where I have a lot of frustration because I believe over the decades, the state has really, really um, punted all of those responsibilities onto cities. Traditionally, cities don't do social work and we don't do mental health work. My fear is given the homeless crisis in conjunction with the fact that the state has pretty much done away with most of those services that public health has traditionally been in their purview, that we will be forced to pick up some of those services now, which we are doing, especially with regard to the homeless. And it's difficult because that's not our area of expertise. We were not equipped, even though we have to become equipped, and we never had the funding there is no additional funding from the state to help us actually address the homeless crisis. So again, I understand the frustration with you know, wanting to provide more services uh, for homeless and social services, but I, I'm not going to, to um, let up uh, or, or take away from the department where we have effective work going on. Uh, then, then I'm gonna be creating a new set of problems for this community and I'm not, I'm not gonna be willing to recommend that. Chief, I don't hey, know if you have anything to say. 
Yeah, sure, Gabe, I can weigh in. Um, yeah, I agree with what the city manager said. Over-policing does not increase crime, but it could increase uh, incarceration rates. There's no doubt about that. Um, I don't feel that we do over-policing in Oxnard, um, but it is an issue that I'm always willing to look at. Um, in regards to why does the police take such a high percentage of the budget and other cities, uh, it's a lower percentage. If you look at it, cities essentially, like the easy answer is cities that have more money, public safety is going to be a smaller portion of the budget um, because all cities are gonna have a very basic, very uh, fundamental services that they provide it. And, and it starts with public safety. And then as cities get more money in their budget, they're able to do more things. Thank you. Great, thank you both. Um, the next ones are, again, uh, these are actually staffing questions for the city. Would, it, would there be savings if the city were to implement furlough days? And then as a follow-up, what does one furlough day equal to in terms of savings? So uh, the answer would be yes, if we, if we implement a furlough. Uh, and you saw on one of the slides earlier where I specifically am trying to avoid that uh, for a couple of reasons. One is we're extremely lean already. And, and I know the critics uh, say, you know, you gotta cut the fat. Um, come find the fat and I'll cut it. I'm telling you, we're lean. Uh, if we were to do a furlough day, uh, I believe we would save about $10 million. Um, now, what that means, though, is remember, this city is already on a 980 schedule. So this city is already closed every other Friday. So that would mean that we're only open for services um, one week, four days, and the next week, three days. And th there's th th we're not going to function well that way. It just It just makes no sense to me. Again, if, if, you're, if you're in a healthier fiscal uh, condition and then you're hit by a recession, of, uh, a temporary furlough is a good tool. But it would, it would really, really decimate our services. Now, um, as I said earlier, you know, halfway through this new fiscal year, if we're confronted with, with continued revenue loss and the recession is continuing, and the pandemic has not ended, meaning there is no, no vaccine. And we can see the, the trajectory of revenues continuing to decline. We will come to the council in January and we will, we, we will be forced to recommend some severe cuts, meaning eliminations of entire programs. I, I just hope we won't need to do that. Okay, so I think looking at time, we'll take just a couple more questions on here. And as I mentioned, if we didn't get to your question, um, uh, you know, we'll send it over to our panelists and we'll send those out to everybody. And um, I'm trying to um, go through them to see what is uh, similar uh, in questions so that maybe we can answer a couple questions with just having it asked once. So my apologies on, on that if we did miss yours, but we will get to them. And so uh, the next one I have here again is uh, in regards to staffing and um, when they, so if you move city engineers from the general fund, will that impact city infrastructure repairs and maintenance such as street repairs, et cetera? It won't impact the ordinary repairs. What it does is it just doesn't allow us to start any new capital improvement projects. But again, our, our general fund portion of the regular and routine maintenance is already uh, bad, right? It's not, and that's my point. It's we're in a bad situation. All right. Um, are there any large businesses that have committed to move to Oxnard um, and then bailed after COVID? There's one that I'm aware of. Um, that um, had been we had been negotiating with, and uh, actually it was just this week that they told us that they just can't continue uh, the, the process they were in. Uh, good news is though, uh, 
we have been in a negotiation for about seven, six or seven months with another very large business um, that could that if we if we cross the finish line this summer will bring us um, much much needed jobs, and and they are not bailing out; they are pushing forward. So I'm really I feel very positive about that in terms of the potential jobs that could be here in a few years. Great, thank you. So um, as we round things out, um, we uh, given what's going on right now, I can see the theme around the questions for Oxnard PD, and I want to honor as many of those as I can. Appreciate it, people sending those in. Um, there is a question uh, that I think is probably um, one that might be simple for uh, Chief Whitney to answer. It's why is Ventura PD's budget forty-eight million dollars compared to Oxnard's seventy-five million? Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know Ventura's uh, dynamics. They are about half our size, so that, that's that's not surprising to me. I, I mean, it looks like their budget proportionally is is bigger than ours. So, um, in regards to a city their size, what you're saying is that their size and their budget amount allocated to them, if you compare apples to apples, they're actually funded at a higher percentage than what Oxnard PD is. Is that correct? I mean, it, it looks it looks like it from those numbers. I haven't looked closely at their budget recently. Yeah. Okay. And then um, I there is a question that came up. They said that I marked it answered, but we didn't answer it. What were the reasons for revenue decline pr in prior years? I, I, I don't know. And I'm not, I mean, there, there, well, it depends on how far you go back, right? So let's, let's obviously, if you go back to the 2008 recession, then you can follow that graph. Uh, I'm not convinced there was significant revenue decline, right? I mean, there's, you know, I've talked about this in the past and I, and I, I don't want to continue to fixate on it, but there's definitely been a period of less than stellar management and leadership. Um, in this organization. I mean, and, and I think people know that, but here's the thing. We're, we're, we've got a, a new um, leadership team here. We've got a very, very proactive city council now. We're looking towards the future. We, we can't keep looking in the rear view mirror. So when, when I look, for example, at that forecast for the 10 year forecast, it, it, it confounds me the one that they uh, proposed uh, back in, I think it was 2015, it's confounding. But, you know, I, I, can, I can only look at the time that I've been here and we're unfortunately, again, as we were just starting to make some really concrete progress this past year, we get hit with this, this um, pandemic and this recession and it's just not, it's just the worst timing possible for an organization that was, still climbing out of a hole. Remember, we were in the hole before this, this uh, recent events around the world. All right, I think the last question we'll get to here is um, a pretty good one in regards to budget and the, the general budget as a whole and Oxnard PD and is in alignment with a lot of the conversations that are happening now locally, statewide and nationally. And then we'll go to the one um, public comment we have uh, thus far um, after this question. So this question, and Alex and um, Chief Whitney, if you want to chime in on this too, uh, you've said repeatedly that the city is in need of money. All options should be on the table in this time of crisis. Why is reducing the police budget not considered to be an acceptable option here? All hands on deck scenario. So first of all, I am reducing the police department's budget, number one. Number two, relative to what's happening across the country, what we need to do here as, as um, city hall leadership is examine the city of Oxnard's context with regard to policing. And we're working on all those things. We actually, frankly, our chief has been working on that, on those issues in his years here. So we're gonna have uh, further discussions about that. Um, we're organizing uh, a virtual town hall in the next couple of weeks to address these issues. But for me, the bottom line is we need to address 
uh, the national issues, not ignore the national issues, but we need to address them in the Oxnard context, not in the Minneapolis context, not in the New York context, not in the LA context, not in the Oakland context, but in the Oxnard context. We need to work together to continue to improve this community that includes the police department, but is not exclusively focused on the police department. Chief, if you have anything to say. Yeah, yeah, just from my experience, I, I think it's it's easy to talk about reducing the budget and the abstract, the big picture. Uh, my experience over the years, and we have been uh, making cuts year after year after year, essentially, um, for the most part, the last 10 years, we've been cutting uh, line items, uh, cutting uh, programs here and there. And every single time we go to a neighborhood council meeting uh, or we go even at, at the council meeting at budget and we talk about the cuts to public safety, the residents come out when we talk about, okay, what those specific cuts actually mean. It means fewer neighborhood policing officers, uh, fewer beat officers. Uh, we cut the uh, cold case detective. We cut the street narcotics team. We cut a canine unit. Every, every time we do that, when it's a, when the residents see what the cut actually is, it's it's not so such an easy cut. Um, we're always going to be great partners with the city, um, and so if the city leaders say, "Hey, we need to cut the police department more," we'll, we'll cut the police department more. But it comes at a cost. There is a, a lower level of service. Great, thank you. And um, just to clarify once more, what was the um, cut for this year for um, Oxnard PD in total from the general fund? 1.4, 1.4 million. Yeah, it was 1.8 in cuts and then it was offset by 400,000 less in revenue. Okay, so um, net lot or a net cut of $1.4 million. And that was that final right. question did come on YouTube actually from um, Viva Oxnard. So I just wanted to, um, answer that because they asked That's, if they could answer, ask a question and I said yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thanks Viva Oxnard. Thanks for watching. Okay, so we have one public comment um, from uh, Manny Herrera. I'm going to unmute you in just a second. And um, again, I want to thank everybody for jumping on as we wind down here. And um, to explain this portion, how I'm going to run this part, I'm going to share my screen real quickly here. So if anyone else would like to um, make a comment, we have a few minutes left for that. But um, the idea here is that I'm going to unmute you and you can make a comment and our panelists can respond. Or if you have something that didn't quite fit into the question box, uh, you can use that now. Um, you'll see there's a timer here on your uh, screen. And this isn't like a formal city council meeting or INCO meeting where you get three minutes and when, you're, when it beeps, you're done. We're going to take you off or anything. But we do have it there just out of consideration of everybody else's time. And so um, really think about how you can succinctly uh, make your comment or ask your question. So uh, Mr. Herrera, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. You should get a notification. OK, can everyone hear me? Yes, sir. All right, well, first of all, thank you so much for, for doing this. Uh, you know, one thing I've always said is uh, informing the people and giving them a, a chance to speak and, and give their concerns is, is always a great thing for everybody involved. So I want to thank everybody uh, for making this happen. Um, so, Mr. City Manager, um, and I say this with all due respect, um, if you recall last year uh, during our, our budget talks, you know, you had uh, proposed you know, shutting down the pack and the fire station, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you said that that's what had to happen and there's no other way around it and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we, you know, the citizens and others um, didn't agree with that. And we, we pushed a little and we said, look, let's figure something else out. Let's see what we can do, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then we were able to save the pack uh, we were able to save uh, the fire station on the south side. So, and again, I, I'm not trying to put you down or anything. I'm just saying, you know, that's what happened last time. You said that was it. There's no other way around it, but it turned out that there were, there were other options. 
So my question to you is, are you sure this is the only option we have right now with this sales in, uh, increase? Is that the only option? Have you looked at other options? I do know, and I commend you for stepping outside the box and looking for other revenue like the billboards and the PUC credits and all that. I mean, that brought in some money. Um, now you, you didn't mention um, the, some of the salary cuts um, that, that the top management is, is, is getting. So I'm glad you guys are doing that. When I first met you, the very first day I met you, I talked to you about that. I said, hey, this, is, this budget, uh, these budget cuts are affecting everybody, not just the citizens. So why, are, why aren't top management doing their part? And it looks like finally they are. So my first question to you is, uh, well, that's my second question, is is top management reducing everything they can? I mean, what about the like car allowances and all that other stuff, what I call perks? Has that been addressed? Is that another way? Um, I mean, I know it's just a little a penny here, a dime there, but it all adds up. So, so have you looked at other options and as far as management um have are they did they hit bot, rock bottom as far as the lowest they can go in their cuts or car allowances and so forth so if you could first answer those two questions gabe am i back on yeah i can hear you okay oh yeah so hi manny how are you good how are you Yes, I love the fact that you always remind everyone that uh, the first time we meet at my first council meeting, you asked me to take a pay cut. That's, I love that, <laughs> uh, which is great. So, um, so first of all, are we looking at other ways? And, and you know, to your point about last year that, that the community saved the, uh, the fire station pack. Listen, yes, the community uh, encouraged the council to go into our reserves and to go into measure O to save those places uh, for the fiscal year. So the truth is you didn't save those entities. What, we, what we've done is we continued in essence, the credit card uh, uh, spending program for a city. None of these things are, are safe because if you look at the overall long, long range forecast, as I showed you that, that the city received uh, several years before I got here, the forecast was for deficit spending and double digit million dollar cuts year after year. So these things can't be saved unless we right size our revenue and our expenses. And, and it is not an issue where everyone's overpaid and we got too many people. We're, we're in a labor market with other cities. So yeah, I did get the executives uh, to take uh, reductions for this coming year. And, and as you know, I volunteered my own uh, larger pay cut. Believe it or not, those amounts aren't going to make a huge difference in the budget. Right? I just believe that, that we had to do that, that that was the right thing to do to send the right message. But at a certain point, if, if, I, if I reduce everyone's pay, Manny, to, to, uh, to a point where they're just going to go work at another city nearby, it doesn't help us as an organization. I mean, the problem we have here is a revenue problem. So if you if you think that this problem, that we haven't looked at everything, I have looked at everything. And I've got a lot of smart people around me, uh, not just here in City Hall, but in the community that are that are offering all kinds of ideas and suggestions. But fundamentally, our revenues don't match the service requirements that we have for a city of this size. It really, really just comes down to that. So we, we, like I said, we're making progress on economic development areas in those areas, but that alone is not going to turn it around. Okay. And, and, and in terms of what's happening with this budget, I mean, I, based on what I learned from this community's priorities last year, I'm recommending something that I hope is, is easier to handle. But, okay. but the numbers are what they are. We're, we're at 2.2% of the reserve uh, uh, next year. 
at the end of next year, that's not good. That is extremely thin ice to be on as an organization. Yes, and I totally agree. Um, so, so thank you for your answer. If, if, if you don't mind, I, I just have a couple quick more questions here. Um, that's up to Gabe, not me. Gabe, is. can I ask just a couple quick more questions? Uh, I'm gonna take that as a yes. So, <laughs> Mr. City Manager, um, you mentioned, you gave an example of the property tax. You gave the example of, let's say there's a home of 300,000 and the property tax on that would be 3,000. And that um, I believe you said the, the county gets 17% or something and we only get a small portion of that. Is there any way to like renegotiate that? Is there any way we could get a bigger cut of that? and a bigger cut of the sales tax? So uh, very quickly, so of that, um, we get $528 out of that property tax. And the, the property tax is something that is in the purview of the state. And if, you, if you're gonna change that, then you're hitting uh, one of California's sacred cows, which is Prop 13. You'd have to repeal Prop 13 in order to revalue properties across the state to their present day values. And then you would be able to tax them on their present day values. Yeah. Well, I wasn't suggesting charge it a higher rate. I'm saying us, Oxnard gets a bigger cut of it. No, it's it, the cut we get is the cut everybody gets across the state. Okay. Um, and then just lastly, real quick, this is, as you know, this is going to be a hard sell. It's going to be a really hard sell. So, you know, I, I, and I agree, we're in a situation right now where, my God, you know, it's, it's terrible. And there are no good answers there. They're, somebody's going to get hurt somewhere along the line. And, you know, at the end of the day, we all have to pay the price. So, hey, uh, you know, you, you're doing a good job and, you know, keep it up and uh, let's all work together. And it's going to be a hard sell. So good luck to you. And uh, but keep. Keep informing the people, keep them up to date. And I'm glad you did this ahead of time so that they're prepared for this and, and let, let's see what happens. So thank you all very much. And thanks to you. I have not been to the gym in two years. Thank you. <laughs> well, you look great. So yeah. you don't need to go to the gym. <laughs>
and you know there's more policing going on then why do we not get these issues addressed yeah gabe can you guys hear me yes yes we can yeah so um the fireworks are out of out of control in our city right now. I was yesterday working in my office. I left at 10 o'clock. I was in there from 8 to 10. And I heard um, probably every hour in at the police building about four loud mortars. They sounded like bombs. Um, I don't know what the percentage of our population is that, that fires them off, but if it is, you know, 15 or, or 20%, you're still talking about, you know, thousands of people that fire them off. And if they fire them off in their backyard, those, those mortars that I heard last night, they could have come anywhere from, you know, a three mile, three mile radius of the station. So it's, it's super frustrating. Um, it's super frustrating for us. There's only so much we can do. We can't force a way into somebody's house or somebody's backyard. Uh, one of the things that we're going to do this year with uh, the drones is we're going to have the drones up um, the weekend of the 4th of July, and we're going to try to find, uh, we're going to try and cite uh, houses where they're firing off the, the fireworks. Um, but that is, there was, a, there, there was a question earlier about over-policing, and does over-policing increase crime? And I said increases incarceration. That actually is like a perfect segue into this this dialogue of how much policing do you want us to do how aggressive do you want us to be in in citing fireworks so it's it's a good it's a good question um fourth of july we i would say we have um i don't know the like i said i don't know these numbers exactly 15 or, or 20 percent say the population either lights them or is in, implicitly uh, condones them probably uh, 40 or 50 percent of the population is you know very frustrated sure. because of dogs uh, maybe they're elderly they have physical conditions PTSD etc so it is frustrating uh, when I left last night from work I was just one call after another coming in for fireworks so it's very frustrating for us thanks Gabe Thank you. And just as a quick follow up to that, thank you, uh, Mr. Yeah. for that. I hope I'm saying your last name correctly. Um, the response time for police, uh, it seems like that's, I saw that there were goals in the um, budget report that was released yesterday as far as response time by Oxnard PD. Uh, how close are we to hitting those at our current level of funding and service? Like when uh, he brings up a really great uh, question about response time for um reports and i'm sure there's prioritization and a number of factors that play into it but how does how does that look for response time from opd yeah response times are so there's uh, most of the calls fit into three priorities uh priority one plus is a like a violent crime in progress we hit our numbers on those almost all the time it, it's um like 85 percent of the time we hit our numbers so it's good for that um and then there's a priority one call uh, there's, uh, those are crimes in progress and it goes priority two, priority three. The reality is, and, and it, it's interesting to me, there's this assumption on this call from many, uh, commentators that, uh, whatever the number is 62 or 75 million, that somehow that is an overabundance of funding in police. And I will tell you that it's, it's not, um, it's adequate just uh, just barely adequate and so um, any police department on the priority three calls it, it's going to be an extended response it's just the nature of the business great thank you for that okay so we're a little past nine o'clock and so i'm going to go ahead and uh, close things out here as far as the q a portion um, all of the questions that were submitted, um, they're not going to go into a black hole. I will organize them and send them over to our panelists. And then um, once we get all the questions or the answers back, uh, we can send it out to everybody who registered for the event. Because it's why they ask for your email address when you register in case we need to follow up with anything. So you can look forward to those. 
we did have a couple questions come in on the YouTube live stream, which is great. I'll include those as well. So thank you for folks who are asking questions on the YouTube live stream. So uh, thank you again to all of our panelists, to uh, Mr. Alex Nguyen, our city manager, to our police chief, Scott Whitney, and to our CFO, who um, uh, I know was there with uh, Alex. And then he's here, to, but he's not doing any work. <laughs> and to our chief, uh, fire chief, Darwin Base. So thank you all very much uh, for that. And uh, Jack, do you have anything you'd like to share as we close it out? As the no, no, I don't. Just thanking everybody for their participation and those uh, listening. And uh, hopefully it went great to everybody. Great. Thank, thank you all you again very all much. Too. Yes, thank you. Thank you Thanks, all Gabe. very much. Have a thank great you guys. evening. And we will follow up with uh, all of these items. Thank you. <laughs>